I came home a year ago. Alex didn't. He was my best friend, the only one I could share everything with. Now I have no one but you, strangers on the internet. Sometimes it feels like I didn't return from that place either, at least not as myself. A part of me, perhaps my desire to live, stayed behind. I guess you could say I'm depressed. It isn't until now I feel ready to tell anyone about what happened to us. We went through something so unfathomable that it's difficult for me to put it into words, but I'll do my best. Back when it happened, almost two years ago, my best friend and I were both studying anthropology in France, and we were both avid cave explorers. During summer break, we explored the most famous cave systems in France, and studied all of the well-known cave paintings and remains from the Neolithic era. We both lived for this, so it was a no-brainer for both of us to spend our summer break doing the same kind of thing as we did at the university. We had followed established guidelines, but the last week before we returned to our university town, we decided to explore Ragourdou in search of caves that hadn't been discovered yet. This was a bit irresponsible since none of us were experienced enough for such an undertaking, but we were both thrill-seekers, and even though we didn't believe we would find anything the search itself was exciting enough for us to keep going. However, we did find something. It was Alex who saw it first. He yelled at me from where he was doing his business. Hey, Lester, come check this out! What is it? You want me to see you pee? I laughed at the thought of it. No, man, I think I found something. I got up from the rock I was sitting on and walked over to him. So, what did you find? Look, look at that boulder next to the cliff. Do you see it? I did see it. There was a small entrance behind it. No way, I said, but then I collected myself so that I wouldn't get too excited. Do you think it's possible? I mean, do you think it might lead to a larger cave? I don't know, Alex said. There's only one way to find out, right? I guess, I said, feeling my heart rate increase. It could be nothing. I find it hard to believe that no one would have discovered a cave system in this area. We aren't that far away from the main road. It's so small, Alex said. It's easy to imagine it could have been missed. Anyway, shut up and help me move this boulder. We had to use all of our strength and some of our equipment to push it aside. We crouched down and looked inside the entrance. I expected it to be nothing more than a small recess, but it was deep. Hello! Alex yelled into the hole in the cliff, and the echo slowly faded away somewhere far inside the bedrock. We debated what to do next, but the excitement in our voices made it clear we had already decided. The responsible thing to do would have been to report our findings and let professionals map out the cave, but we weren't going to just hand over a finding like this to someone else. Instead, we put on our gear. We crawled our way inside of the cave. Had we been just a tad bit bigger, we would never have fit. That was how small the opening was. I didn't suffer from claustrophobia. If I did, I wouldn't have been a cave explorer but I didn't enjoy small passages like this. The thought of getting stuck still made me cringe. I had read enough horror stories about cave explorers getting killed that way to do my best to avoid crawl spaces, but in this case I made an exception. Alex went in first and I followed close behind him. A few meters in, a cold wind reached us. Are you feeling this? Alex said as he pushed his body through the small cave. That's a cross breeze. Good, I said with some relief in my voice. That means there's an opening somewhere further ahead. The cold air coming from inside the cave smelled fresh. It was exactly what we needed after having spent the entire day under the scolding heat outside. A short while later, however, we began to freeze. I asked Alex if he knew how it could be so cold. It seemed way too cold to be explained by the airflow, but he was as clueless as me. Is it getting tighter or wider? I asked. I can't tell. I'm not sure either, Alex said. We kept going. 
My body ached. In some places, it was so narrow that I thought I would have to break my ribs to get through. The cave went upward, forcing us to climb, and then it went down until it turned sharply and continued to the south. The total absence of light except for our headlights felt suffocating. We came across a pitch, a steep section that we had to use our ropes to get down. We had never tried cave diving before and I felt really stupid doing it, now given how risky it was. A few more dangerous squeezes followed. The dust on the ground kept getting into my mouth. By now I was exhausted. I think we should turn back, I said. I'm getting too tired, and frankly, I'm starting to worry a little bit. We've been here for more than an hour. Perhaps we should try again tomorrow. Don't give up, Lester, Alex said. It will be extremely difficult to go back the way we came. There's nowhere to turn around. Our best shot is to keep going and try to find the other opening. I could hear fear in his otherwise confident voice. Something that scared me just as much as our predicament. Just moments later, Alex spoke again. There's an opening ahead. It leads to a larger room. Just a few more meters. I had to push Alex to press him through the opening. And as soon as he was out, he pulled me out. The room was big enough for us to stand in. It was only illuminated by our flashlights and headlights. Looking back at the hole we just came out of, it was clear that it was too small for us to enter. Squeezing yourself out of a tiny hole is one thing, crawling inside of it another. Realizing this, my heart almost stopped. If the hole that let the cold air in was too small as well, if there was such a hole at all, we would die in here. I pointed my flashlight at Alex's face. His frosty, agitated breath told me he was just as terrified as I was. Slowly, we tracked the walls with our flashlights. To our relief, there was a second opening big enough for us to enter. Before I had time to cool down, something inside of the opening caught my eye. It was a skeleton, covered in some dark clothes. The lower part of its body was still inside the hole meaning he or she must have died trying to crawl out of it and gotten stuck. Shit, Lester, Alex said. It's good news, I said with a shaky voice. It means we're going to get out. We sat down next to the remains, first to examine it, and then to move it so that we could enter the small opening. The skull was lying face down, but based on the color of the bones, we immediately saw that this skeleton wasn't prehistoric. There was no soft tissue left, but as far as skeletons go, it looked rather fresh. Alex reached for the skull and carefully picked it up and held it in front of us. Give me some light, he said. I shone my flashlight on the face of the skull. It almost looked like it was smiling at us, a big horrific grin. Put it away, I said. Wait, Alex said. Look at it. There's something... What? I asked in a whisper. Can't you see it? He asked rhetorically. I was too stressed to see anything particular with it. It's surprisingly elongated. He turned the skull around. The back of its head is massive. And look at the top. Not very globular, you see. I began to see what he was talking about but my mind didn't grasp what he was trying to tell me. So, I said. He turned the skull around so that the face was staring at us again. Look at its facial structures. Very pronounced. What are you trying to say? Its eyebrows are heavy. Look, Lester. I know this is going to sound crazy, but I think we are looking at the skull of a Neanderthal. That is crazy, I said although I could clearly see the similarities from the skulls we had been studying in class. Look at the bones. It must have died at least within this century. I know, Alex said, and yet this is clearly the skull of a Neanderthal. I mean, I know Neanderthal DNA in humans can affect the shape of the skull, but this is something else. Do you think the environment in the cave could have helped preserve the bones this well? I don't know. 
That would be pretty crazy as well, but I can't think of any explanation right now that wouldn't be completely bonkers. With a mixture of fear, confusion, and excitement, we decided to carefully move the remains away from the opening and leave the cave so that we could report our findings to the university. This passage was larger, and we could make our way through it with ease. The worry disappeared from our voices as we crawled, and the excitement over what we had found took over. We did fear what the faculty would say about our amateurish expedition, but surely our discovery would compensate for our foolishness to some degree. We saw the light at the end of the cave, but strangely enough, it was still cold. Alex got out first. Something is wrong, he said as I exited the cave. I saw what he meant. There were patches of snow in the grass. This was in late August, and it had been one of the warmest summers in recent memory. Dumbfounded, we looked around trying to figure out what was going on. In front of us, there was a set of large boulders obscuring the view. We slowly walked past them and entered the forest. It seemed thicker than before. How much time did we spend in that cave? Alex said, trying to make it sound like a joke, although he was obviously frightened. It's winter, or... I mean, it's early spring, at least. I looked up at the sun, filtered behind a cover of clouds. The sun is where it is supposed to be, I said. Whatever is going on, this is the same day. I reached for my phone. The time and date were as expected, but there was no reception or internet connection. We tried to walk around the cliff we had come out of in an attempt to find our camp, but on the other side, there was nothing to be found. The disorientation I felt trying to comprehend what was happening almost gave me a panic attack. But there wasn't any time to panic. A gunshot echoed through the forest. Two more followed. We decided to walk toward the sounds in the hopes to find someone to talk to. However, we moved slowly so that we would see them before they saw us. We came to a small hill. Sounds of voices came from the other side of it, but we couldn't hear what they were saying. We climbed up on the hill, lay down on top of it, and peeked down. On the ground beneath us, there was a large, dead animal covered in thick fur. That's... Alex began. That's a mammoth, I continued. A group of people holding rifles stood around the dead animal. Four of them were smoking, as far as I could see. They were covered in black cloths, similar to the one we had found in the cave, and they all had hoods on them, which made it difficult to see their faces. They didn't speak any language we had ever heard before. It reminded us of the Khoisan language, but instead of the clicking sounds normal for those languages, it sounded like knocking sounds coming from the bottom of their throats. Both Alex and I had the same impossible thought, that they belonged to the same species as the individual we had found in the cave. One of them blew a whistle. It didn't make any sound that we could hear, but a minute later, four large animals came out of the woods. What are those? I whispered. They were as big as grizzly bears, but had wolf-like faces. Some of them began barking. I... I think they're dogs, Alex said. Have you ever seen dogs like that before? I said. Look around you, Lester. Alex paused as to think of the best way to explain it to my frantic mind. Don't you get it? I know it's fucking insane, but just consider what all of this is pointing to. Those people aren't humans, man. What are you on about? I said, trying to deny his conclusion to the bitter end. Are you really saying... They had have a language, and going by the way they're moving their hands, parts of it are sign language. Alex was way ahead of me already. Are you suggesting we have traveled back to the Neolithic Age? No, no, they have guns. As you said, this is the same day. It's just, just not the same Earth. I don't think Homo sapiens led them to extinction here. 
This is incredibly fascinating, Lester. I can't believe it. It feels like I'm dreaming, but you're seeing the same thing, right? I mean, I'm not lying in that cave slowly dying from carbon monoxide poisoning, am I? N no, I'm seeing it too, I said. Well, look at them. They domesticated the dog, but they bred them into something different than we did. And look, they didn't exterminate the megafauna. That points to a smaller population like we always suspected. I still didn't know what to think, but I began to entertain the idea. It could explain the weather as well, I said, while I watched how one of the presumed Neanderthals petted one of the huge dogs. A smaller population of hominids during 40,000 years would have meant a much smaller amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and... Something growled behind us, and then it barked. Our blood ran cold. I looked behind us. One of the large hounds had found us. Lester, Alex whispered as our eyes met. The beast charged at us. We had no choice but to run down from the hill, right into the arms of the cloaked men. They gathered around us, pointing their rifles at us. They were huge, much larger than a typical man, or rather than a human. Their knocking sounds, coming from deep inside their throats, were mixed in with deep sounds that didn't resemble any language I had ever heard. From what I could tell by their hand movements and the agitation in their voices, they seemed just as distressed as Alex and I. Their faces were shadowed by their hoods but I could still see that they had the typical Neanderthal facial structures. My thoughts, still having trouble accepting what was happening, were in disarray. What will they do? I heard myself ask. As soon as I opened my mouth, one of the Neanderthals yelled something at us. Halufska! We both interpreted it as something similar to hands up, and fell on our knees and raised our hands. It all depends on what happened to Homo sapiens in this world, Alex whispered. If they see our species as mortal enemies, we might be doomed. But if we died out thousands of years ago, they'll probably want to keep us alive. The man who had yelled lit what looked like a mixture of a cigarette and a cigar with a large match. I tried to assess their level of technology. The rifles, clearly made for hunting, didn't have scopes, only iron sights. My first thought was that this indicated a lower technological level than the one we had at home, but then I realized that it might rather be a result of their larger eyes and areas of the brain devoted to vision. Maybe they simply didn't need scopes because of their superior sight. They talked for some time, and then one of them went away for a while and came back with some ropes that they used to tie our hands behind our backs. They didn't intend on killing us, not right away anyway. If this said anything about the fate of Homo sapiens in this world was unclear though. They led us away, seemingly abandoning the animal that they had just killed. Maybe finding us was more valuable to them. They've invented the combustion engine, Alex exclaimed. He was right. A vehicle stood on a dirt road in front of us. It had eight wheels, six at the back, and two in the front and resembled a diesel locomotive more than a truck. It was completely black, just like their clothes. They opened the back doors and pushed us inside the storage space. There was a smell of dead animals and gasoline. We were placed next to each other on a bench attached to the wall, and two of the Neanderthals sat down in front of us, looking at us constantly. The only light came from two small windows on the back door. The truck began to move. I wonder what they'll think about our cell phones, Alex said. The Neanderthals each lit one of those big cigarettes, and the glow from them lit up their strong faces. One of them had green eyes. They're smoking a lot, Alex whispered. Research shows that Neanderthal DNA may account for nicotine addiction. Yes, I said, and depression. You think they're depressed? Alex smiled, but the fear in his eyes didn't go away. We couldn't see anything outside, except that the sun was setting, 
but we felt the bumps in the road as the truck drove forward at a pretty high speed. After some time, the road became smooth. Had we reached a highway? It was hard to tell. We couldn't hear any other vehicles outside. Wherever we were going, it was far away. We didn't stop until three or four hours later. It must have been in the middle of the night, but we didn't get to see the night sky. When the back doors were opened, we stepped out inside a large garage. There were a lot of black vehicles parked under the high ceilings, but none of them looked like the one we had come with. These vehicles were smaller, like cars, all black. I guess that this place wasn't where they usually went. The architecture was similar to Soviet-era brutalism and was as devoid of colors as everything else in this place. After what we had already seen, I wasn't surprised to discover that they had mastered electricity. However, they didn't use fluorescent lights as in a modern garage, but rather pretty dim, but still large, lamps hanging from the ceiling. Again, I came to think of their better vision. One of the hunters used a radio attached to the dashboard of their truck. After half an hour or so, a small door opened, the sound of it echoing through the garage. Three people, a bit smaller, walked out of it. The group that had captured us pushed us in our backs so that we would straighten our backs. This seemed to be important to them, as they did it themselves as well. The new people didn't wear the same clothes as our capturers. They still covered their faces, not with hoods, but with thin black veils. As they got closer to us, I could tell that they were women. They looked at us, obviously fascinated. One of them picked up what looked like a walkie-talkie and said something to it without taking her eyes off us. Carefully, her colleague reached out and knocked on my helmet that I was still wearing. We must have looked completely alien to them in our colorful gear and equipment. Although the women were smaller than the men, they were still much stronger than us. One of them led the men to another door, perhaps for questioning, and the other two, holding what looked like electric batons, took me and Alexander back to the door they had exited. We stepped into an elevator. Unlike the elevators we were used to, this one was merely a platform. My clothes scraped against the gray concrete walls of the shaft as we went up. Looking up, I could tell the building was tall. One of the women controlled the elevator with a lever, rather than just pressing a button. It was all clunky and cumbersome, but remarkably effective. They took us to a small room, similar to an interrogation room, and had us sit down on two large chairs. A commotion took place outside of the room. People were running back and forth, talking to each other and into their radios. This scenario was nothing they had planned for. Different women entered the room from time to time. Some of them tried to talk to us, some just wanted to take a look. We sat in this room for hours. After that, two male guards took us to yet another room. It looked like a locker room that had been cleared out for our sake. They seized our belongings. Alex took his helmet off and gave it to the woman who had knocked on it. And then he carefully turned on the headlight to show her how it worked. They didn't seem too surprised by it. Most likely they had similar devices. The colorful plastic interested them much more, which I took as a sign that their technological level was maybe a hundred or fifty years behind ours. Plastic, Alex said without being understood. They stripped off our clothes and pointed at a couple of showers in the middle of the room. We placed ourselves there, and one of the guards turned on the water. It was too cold, but overall they didn't seem to want to cause us any pain. After the shower, we were given a pair of yellow overalls to wear. In the next room, this one looked like a classroom. We were brought to the desk at the front. A group of women, wearing protective masks, had put our smartphones on the desk. Alex took his phone and unlocked it. This was the first time these people would see our level of technology. If they see this, he said to me, if they see how advanced we are compared to them, they'll let us live. He tried to be as pedagogical as he could, showing them the display as he pressed on the different apps. 
Of course, there wasn't any internet connection, so he couldn't show them anything online. Their eyes were transfixed on the colorful display. The males, who didn't seem to be allowed to do anything else but stand guard, peeked down at the display in wonder. Alex smiled at the attention, almost as if he was proud, but I felt severely uneasy. He opened his gallery and showed them a video he had taken at a large climate change protest he had attended in New York. The Neanderthal's fascination turned into worry as they watched the skyscrapers and the hundreds of thousands of people marching down the streets. After this, one of the women looked at us suspiciously as she picked up a phone on the wall and called someone. After some deliberation, two women with batons led us into the elevator again. This time, we stopped at the last floor, maybe 200 meters above the surface. They took us through a corridor with what looked like office doors to the side. To my disappointment, there were no windows. A few other women stepped out of their offices and looked at us as we passed, equally mesmerized as they were scared. At the end of the hallway, there was a door that led into a room of greater importance than the other rooms. There was some text next to the door. I couldn't tell if the characters were phonetic or logographic, but at least they didn't look like hieroglyphs. One of the women pressed a button in the middle of the door. It didn't make any sound, but was probably some sort of doorbell. While we waited for the door to open, a faint alarm could be heard from somewhere nearby, probably outside. And one minute later, the building began to shake a little. I looked at Alex, who looked back at me, but it didn't seem to phase the Neanderthals. The door opened automatically. We were pushed inside the room. It was big, just like everything else. A black carpet, the skin of some animal, covered the floor, and a heavy desk stood in front of us. Behind it, another woman was sitting. Unlike the others, she didn't cover her face. Her hair was red and her eyes were blue. She wore something similar to a jumpsuit, not black, but light gray. She inhaled the smoke of a wooden pipe, rather than from one of those cigarettes, and as she exhaled, I could smell that she was smoking a mix of tobacco and marijuana. Behind her there was a large window, but nothing but darkness could be seen outside. There were no electric lights, which meant we weren't in a city. Perhaps, I thought, they didn't even have cities. The women who brought us here placed their batons at the fold of our knees, giving us an electric shock so that we fell in front of the massive desk. Alex yelled out in pain but didn't look as scared as I was. My body trembled with fear. The woman sitting behind the desk got up from her chair and walked over to us. They spoke over our heads while we remained silent. They wouldn't understand us anyway. They won't harm us, Alex said. We're too valuable for them. I don't want to be locked up in a laboratory, I said. We will find a way. Alex began, but was interrupted by the woman who seemed to be in charge. She gestured toward us in a way that made it clear she wanted us to stand up. Alex got up, but for some reason, I couldn't move. One of the women grabbed my arm and more or less lifted me up on my feet in one swift moment. Their commander, or whatever she was to them, said something. The context didn't allow us to figure out what it was, other than maybe a question. She led us to one of the walls, between two bookshelves filled with what looked like screw-bound books. There was a world map. At first glance, it didn't look like Earth. Alex took a hesitant step forward, and when the woman didn't seem to mind, I did too. I don't get it, I said, way too stressed to think clearly. The woman said something to us again, but this time it sounded more like a command. She probably wanted to know where we came from. Alex put his finger on the map. This is Africa, he said. It wasn't until he said that I saw it. The map had a completely different orientation. Firstly, it was a south-up map meaning upside down from our perspective. Secondly, it was a little bit off-center, 
putting Central Europe right in the middle. And thirdly, the sizes of the land masses were displayed a bit differently. Since we couldn't explain where we came from, Alex tried to give the woman the location of our species' origin instead. By the look of her face, she didn't seem to believe us. Still, she let us study the map while she studied us. Look, Alex said. There are no borders. They don't have countries, I said. But what about these... these pictograms? Small black skulls displayed from the side were spread all over the map. Dotted circles of different sizes surrounded them. Are they some kind of dead zones? You're anthropomorphizing. I don't think they symbolize death here, but rather themselves. Maybe they're cities or some kind of city-states. And look there. He pointed at what would have been Russia in our world. Those skulls are red and, wow, they're different, you see. What does it mean, are you suggesting? I asked. Denisovans. It makes sense if you think about it. With a smaller population, the Neanderthals never drove the other hominid species to extinction. This is unreal. Alex's fascination overshadowed all of his fear. Look, there's a red line going alongside the Ural Mountains, and behind it, the Denisovans live. All the way to Australia, I said. But look here, Alex said without listening to me. He placed his finger at Indonesia. This blue region. The skulls there are different too. Can you see it? Homo floresiensis, I whispered. You bet. The black skulls, the Neanderthals, dominated Europe, Africa, and most of the New World, while the Denisovans seemed to rule Asia and some parts of the west side of South America, together with the small area dominated by Homo floresiensis. The ice caps were, as expected, larger than in our world, but it didn't seem to prevent the Neanderthals from living close to the North Pole. They even had cities in Greenland, although their total amount of cities was smaller than the amount in most countries in our world. The woman, watching us carefully while we inspected the map, took a puff of her pipe and blew the smoke in our faces. Then she returned to her desk and picked up what looked like a mouthpiece and made a call with the device it was connected to. She spoke aggressively to the person at the other end of the call. The alarm from outside that we had heard earlier, sounding like a mechanical Swedish cow horn, came back again. This time, it sounded louder, probably because we stood so close to a window. The woman didn't seem to care about it, but she raised her voice a little to compensate for the noise. Some electric lights turned on outside, but they didn't reveal much. About a minute or two later, huge flames erupted a couple of hundred meters away, and a few seconds later a rumble reached us. A rocket, Alex exclaimed. We couldn't see the body of it in the darkness, but the flame beneath it indicated a launch. The question is, I said, is it headed for space or the Denisovans? After this meeting, the purpose of which we couldn't understand, we were taken to a large cave system beneath the tower structure. It soon became apparent to us that it was a mine combined with a subterranean prison camp. The conditions were, to say the least, hellish. There were hundreds of cells carved out in the bedrock, covered with prison bars, some of them filled with four to five people. They were all wearing yellow overalls, just like us which made my heart sink to my stomach. Denisovans, Alex whispered. He was right. Most of the prisoners weren't Neanderthals. They looked at us, with what looked like confusion in their eyes, as we walked past the cells. It was dark, the only light coming from small lamps hanging from lines in the ceiling, and it smelled of burnt rubber, tobacco, and excrements. Prisoners walked in columns while cloaked Neanderthal men whipped them from behind, ordering them to move forward. They were all carrying shovels, pickaxes, hammers, chisels, and pans. Do you think they're done with us now? I said. Do you think this is where we'll end up? They have seen the proof. 
they know about our world. Either they might try to reach it themselves and discard of us, or they might need us to help them with their mission. I don't know, Lester. They unlocked a cell that had a pretty good view over the mine and pushed us inside. During the night, all we could do was to listen to the echoes of the pickaxes, the whips, and the Denisovans' screams. Poor beings, I said. I'm sure there's a similar cave in Asia filled with Neanderthals, Alex said. There's a certain balance here, you know? What do you mean? I asked. Everyone has their corner of the world, he said. The animals aren't being systematically brought to extinction, and the environment isn't being destroyed. It just took a few Homo sapiens escaping Africa to ruin all of it. We spread like a wildfire. What happened to us here? I mean, to our species? I don't know, Alex said. Perhaps we never evolved. We talked about this the entire night until a prison guard came by with some water and food. The food resembled porridge and had no meat in it aside from a few larvae. It was utterly disgusting. We lived like this for about three weeks, unable to leave the cell. We had to do our business in a bucket that was emptied once a week. It was as humiliating as it was repulsive. I feared we would die from dysentery. Finally, one of the women from the tower, accompanied by a group of armed prison guards, came down to us. She looked at us with dismay in her eyes. Although it was difficult to know exactly what emotions the Neanderthals were showing with their expressions, they led us outside. The daylight hurt our eyes, even though it was filtered through a thick mist. We stepped out on a large square beneath the tower. I looked up and saw the structure, completely black, disappear into the fog above. A group of Neanderthal men, maybe fifty, stood in formation in the middle of the square, while a woman stood in front of them, talking and gesturing. These Neanderthals dressed differently from the ones we had seen so far. They had black metal helmets, and were armed with rifles with somewhat shorter barrels. Soldiers, I thought. My God, Alex said as he pointed at the sky. Out of the mist, accompanied by the deep sound of a horn being blown not far from us, a huge airship resembling a pitch-black zeppelin descended. Some of the soldiers spread out and grabbed the lines that were thrown down from the airship and helped it land in the middle of the square. The rest of the soldiers formed two lines next to the entrance of the ship, and their commander placed herself in the middle, ready to welcome the people who had just arrived. We were led forward until we stood behind the commander. It became clear the ship had arrived because of us. Most likely, it was a group of higher-ups that wanted to investigate us by themselves. We looked on with anticipation as the doors opened. Another group of women exited the ship, dressed in red uniforms that looked a bit more decorated than the ones we had seen so far and walked toward us. The commander in front of us saluted them by bowing, as did the soldiers. By reflex I did the same thing, but Alex remained still. The new group examined us closely. One of them stared Alex down while she grabbed his chin and turned his face left to right. I was scared out of my mind. I couldn't imagine a way out of this. A group of soldiers came out of the airship joining the others. It was clear that our arrival was considered a high priority and that the security at this site was being enforced. Another black vehicle, this time the size of a bus, drove up to us from an arched opening at the other side of the square. We were forced to enter it together with the women and five soldiers. This time, we could see out the windows. They didn't drive us very far, just to another location on the site. The large, dark buildings, including the tower, felt desolated and dismal. Further away, we could see another rocket being moved to the launch pad. Looks like a V-2, Alex whispered. Probably a missile. I wonder what the payload is, I said. It's probably not made for mass destruction, Alex said. There aren't any large populations here. 
Think about that for a second. They've probably never encountered an army of more than 10,000 soldiers. Maybe not even that. They never had their Battle of the Somme. Look at their weapons. They aren't automatic. I don't think they've ever had a reason to massacre thousands upon thousands of enemy forces with machine guns. You know? The bus stopped on a metal platform, patrolled by one of the prison guards, that descended into the ground. It took us to an underground road, as broad as a highway, that was illuminated by dim green lights in the ceiling. The bus drove over a bridge. Tons of water flowed down from above on both sides. The roar of the waterfall was deafening, and the mist rising from underneath engulfed the vehicle. It's amazing how much they've built, Alex said. Using slaves, you can accomplish anything, I said sarcastically. The bus stopped on the other side of the bridge. At first, I didn't understand why, since we were still in the middle of the road. But then, I noticed the small door to our right side. One of the women got up and pointed at Alex. Confusion came upon his face. A soldier stood up and grabbed his arm, saying something to him we couldn't understand. Wait, where are you taking him? I asked naively as they took him off the bus. Alex, Alex! It's okay, Alex yelled. They won't harm us, we're too valuable. You know where I'm being held, find me. He was halfway out when he finished his sentence. I put my hands on the window as I watched them enter the room with him. Alex, I yelled, and then I whispered to myself, Oh shit, oh shit, oh shit. I did my best to memorize everything I saw, and in what order I saw it so that I could find my way back to that door. Further down the road, a group of Denisovan slaves had to step aside to let the bus pass. Their faces were covered with soot and sweat. Ten minutes later, the bus entered a smaller road blocked by a road boom barrier that opened after one of the soldiers stepped outside and pulled a lever. The road ahead was a downward spiral that led to what looked like the garage from earlier, except this one was guarded by soldiers. Why had I been taken to such a secure location when Alex was taken to a small anonymous room? I couldn't figure it out, but my gut told me it wasn't a good sign. After going down a few floors with an elevator, I was brought to what looked like a scientific facility. The walls were white here, rather than the typical gray and a lot of the personnel wore red protective masks. They placed me in a small chamber, dressed me down completely, and washed my malnourished body with a large hose. The cold water made my body shudder and numb. When they were done, they sat me down on top of an examining table in another room. My teeth chattered against each other. I felt hopeless and began to cry. The last time I cried was when my girlfriend broke up with me in 7th grade. The Neanderthals took a step back when they saw me bawl my eyes out. One of the researchers took a cotton swab and collected some of my tears. They checked all the basics, my reflexes, my heart, my ears, my eyes, and embarrassingly enough, my genitals. Aside from the last part, it wasn't much different from a checkup at the doctor's office. The officers consulted with the researchers for a few minutes, and then I was taken to yet another room. It was completely circular. It didn't have prison bars. Just a large window made out of enforced glass, but it was clearly a cell. It only contained a bunk bed and a big stool that I soon figured out was a toilet. Luckily, I was able to flush it. As soon as I entered the room, the door was locked behind me. I stepped up to the window. They were all standing on the other side watching me. One of the officers lit a cigarette. A loudspeaker in the ceiling crackled to life, and a voice began speaking. I can't understand you, I yelled. Of course they knew that. Most likely they were only testing the system. I had studied the remains of their species for years, always imagining them in a Neolithic context as troglodytes wielding spears. Now, as they looked down on my naked body, dressed in their fancy uniforms, the tables had turned. Here, 
I was the prehistoric caveman reappearing from a long-forgotten past. The food they gave me here was a little better than the food we were given before. It was mostly vegetarian, although sometimes it contained meat. Perhaps mammoth. But I didn't like it that much. It was, according to my standards, undercooked. I was kept inside of this room for a long time, constantly monitored. Every day followed the same routine. First, they tested my physical durability and strength, trying to determine my limits. Then they tested my cognition with different kinds of problem-solving tests, similar to standard IQ tests. And lastly, they interrogated me with different methods. The most successful way to communicate was by drawing. I wasn't a very skilled painter, but I was still able to explain certain basic concepts. I did try to learn as much as I could about their language during this time, though. I was even given a lexicon, but it was extremely difficult. I couldn't understand more than a few words, signs, and names. I had some success in translating their numerical system. The main difference was that they didn't use the decimal system, but the duodecimal system. Their objectives in communicating with me seemed to be to understand the technology we had brought with us and where we came from. They always gave me our phones, both mine and Alex's, and instructed me to explain. Their batteries had died, which they seemed to understand, but they didn't believe me when I claimed to be ignorant about how to charge them again. I did, however, draw communication satellites orbiting a globe, and although that was beyond their current level of technology, the idea didn't seem completely alien to them. If anything, they seemed rather impressed by it, as if they had just begun to think about such things themselves. As to my place of origin, I deliberately lied to keep them from blocking the passage for me, in case I would be able to escape later on. Interestingly enough, they never resorted to torture. They appeared to care a lot about my health, even though I was still losing weight at an alarming rate. One day, during one of the interrogations, they showed me black and white photographs of fossils. On one of them, there was a skull. It had belonged to an anatomically modern Homo sapiens. The interrogator put a world map on the table and pointed to an area in East Africa. I nodded and inspected the region more closely than I had done before. To my surprise, I noticed a pair of large lakes, but still tiny on the map, in the vicinity of what would have been Kenya in my world. At first, I didn't think much of it, but after I returned to my room later, I thought about them a great deal. They didn't belong there. I couldn't be entirely sure because I didn't have a perfect picture of the world map in my head. But I became more or less convinced that those lakes weren't a part of my world. Perhaps, I thought, they were the point of divergence. Maybe they were craters. Something must have hit us in this world before we had time to leave Africa, I thought. But after the ancestors of the Neanderthals did, I opened my eyes and said out loud, My God! We went extinct. After a month or two, I hadn't learned how their calendar worked, so I'm not sure what unit of time they would have used. The doors opened in the middle of the night. I could see the silhouettes of the researchers and officers on the other side of the window. A red light lit them from behind and the shadow of cigarette smoke rose to the ceiling. A small, dark figure entered the room. A loud voice came from the speakers. It wasn't speaking to me, but to the figure that had just come inside my room. My heartbeat went into overdrive, and I thought it was going to burst out of my chest. I hid under my covers. As the figure stepped into the red light coming from the window, I saw that it was a girl. Given how much smaller she was compared to the other women, and how youthful she looked, it became clear to me that she was a teenager, not older than 16 years old. It didn't take long for me to understand what was going on. Their reproductive ethics were nothing like my own. I quickly got up from the bed 
covered my naked body with the covers, and walked over to the window. You can't do this, I yelled, banging on the glass with both of my hands. Get her out of here, please. It was hopeless. I tried to open the door, but it was locked as usual. The girl hid away in a corner when she saw me, and I hid away at the other end of the room. The speaker kept talking, and after a few minutes, the Neanderthal girl tried to approach me. She slowly walked toward me, but as soon as she came too close, I quickly ran to the other side of the room. Was she forced somehow? Perhaps they threatened her family? Or had she volunteered out of honor? It didn't matter. I was being forced. They had tested my abilities, compared my hereditary potential to their own, and decided to mix their species with mine to create a superior being, perhaps to finally outcompete the Denisovans. You don't understand, I yelled. It's a mistake. You're dooming yourself into oblivion. And I didn't know how to explain it so that they could understand. I kept running away from the girl as soon as she came close. In the morning, when the lights turned on, I could see her more properly. She was wearing thin fabrics, revealing her naked body underneath, and her hair was black. She looked sad, but there were no tears in her big eyes. Her rapid breathing made it clear to me that she was just as afraid as I was, if not more. They didn't feed me, nor the girl this day. I began to cry for the second time in this place. They knew what they were doing, no food or water, until, realizing this, the futility of it all, I once more banged on the window. She's a child, goddammit. My voice echoed into nothingness. The Neanderthal commander lit a cigarette. According to these people, I had to assume, it didn't matter how young the girl was, as long as she was fertile. I refused for three days. Both the girl and I were dying of thirst. Most likely, they wouldn't let me die, but I was pretty sure they would sacrifice her. In the end, I couldn't let that happen. During the three days, I tried to communicate with the girl. Of course, we didn't understand each other, but we did learn each other's names. Her name was Dura. I cried for the third time during the act. I shut my eyes and tried to imagine something. Someone else. But of course, there wasn't any pleasure. All I felt was anger toward my captors who silently watched us. On the fourth day, they came inside and got the girl. I tried to tell her I was sorry, and although she didn't understand my words, I think she understood. The next day, I was given a pretty substantial meal. This time, they even added fruits. They looked alien to me, but I wasn't surprised by that. Most fruits I was used to had been domesticated, cultivated for millennia, by humans. It was natural for another hominid species to do it differently than us. There was a bitter taste to most of the fruits, but it was still an improvement to what I had been given so far. Several months passed. I did my best to forget about Dora, constantly trying to convince myself that I didn't have a choice. The endless examinations and interrogations continued. From time to time, new officers and researchers arrived to pick my mind. I always complied. Occasionally, I tried to ask them about the whereabouts of Alex, but without success. Each time they took me to the examination room, I tried to find weaknesses in their security. I counted the guards and the doors and tried to come up with a plan to escape. But in my weakened condition, and given their superior physical strength, I didn't have a chance. I slowly gave up, crying myself to sleep every night. But one of those nights, everything changed. I was awakened by the sound of a gunshot. Someone screamed, and then there was another gunshot. Everything went silent for a minute. I sat up and tried to listen. Nothing. All I heard was my frozen breath. Then the door to my room opened. A heavily cloaked and veiled figure appeared. Who's there? I asked. The figure grabbed my arm. I tried to fight it off, but then I saw who it was. 
It was Dora. She wanted me to come with her. Although I was confused about what was going on, my instinct immediately told me to take this opportunity. I covered my body with the bedclothes and followed her down the corridor. She was wearing one of the soldier's guns. I had no idea how she got her hands on it, but given the circumstances, it was clear to me that she had escaped somehow. A researcher shot to death lay in a pool of blood on the floor. Dora was quick, although I could only see her eyes under her hood. I could tell she was determined and that her life depended on her success in this attempt. As to why she had chosen to save me, if that was what she was doing, I had no idea. She had stolen some kind of card and opened door after door. She stopped and signaled me to do the same. Around the corner, I could hear radio chatter. Dora shut her eyes for a few seconds, then she loaded the rifle in a swift motion stepped around the corner and pulled the trigger. Shit, 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 I whispered to myself as I followed Dura around the corner. The guard was shot in the head, right between the eyes, and blocked the door to the elevator that had brought me to this place. She picked up the rifle, checked if it was loaded, and gave it to me without hesitation. It was heavy, but that might just have been because of my weakened condition. As soon as Dura pulled the lever to the elevator, an alarm sounded and a red light filled the corridor. Her escape must have been reported now. Just before the platform descended, a group of guards came running toward us. Luckily, this elevator had a roof which made it impossible for them to shoot down at us from above. Dura reloaded her rifle again, and when we approached the bottom floor, the garage, she sat down and pointed the rifle in front of her. She gestured toward me, seemingly telling me to sit down behind her. I was too afraid, or too frantic, to use the rifle in my hand. I just covered behind her. The alarm echoed through the garage. Four guards waited for us a few meters away. Dura immediately shot one of them and ran to the right. I followed. The other three guards yelled and began chasing us. They both fired upon us but missed, or perhaps more likely chose not to hit me because they wanted me alive. I turned around and fired my rifle holding it to my belly, hitting one of the guards in the leg. It was pure luck. I hadn't named at all. Dura stopped next to one of the cars, shot the door handle with her rifle, and entered it. I sat down next to her. I could see more guards exit the elevator. However, as Dura drove off, ramming the road barrier, the guards didn't try to come after us. I hyperventilated as Dura sped up to almost 100 miles per hour. The engine rumbled and roared like an angry beast. Dura steered to the side, and half a second later, a group of Denisovan slaves swished past us. They were walking in the middle of the road. Next, I saw the door to the room where they had taken Alex. I yelled for Dura to stop, pointing at the side of the tunnel. She looked at me, confused. We didn't have any time to stop. I felt like I betrayed my friend, but I didn't have a choice. Most likely, I thought, they had taken him somewhere else by now anyway. We came upon the bridge from earlier. The sound of the falling water drowned the sound of the raging engine of the car. Dora hit the brakes hard. I almost flew through the windshield. We spun out of control on the wet, slippery road, and then, in an instant, came to a full stop. Dura stepped out on the road. I didn't understand what was happening until I got out. The water vapor formed such a thick mist around us that it was difficult to breathe. And behind all that mist, on the other side of the bridge, I saw it. A barricade that had been set up to stop us. Dura stood in front of me, her rifle over her shoulder, and stared at the shadows behind the mist. We couldn't go back from where we had come. I had no idea how we would get out of this situation. Dura didn't share my uncertainty. She turned around and walked toward me with assertive steps. I was confused, scared, and ready to give up. 
but Dora still seemed to know exactly what she was doing. She grabbed my hand, said something I couldn't understand, and dragged me to the ledge of the bridge. Without hesitation, she climbed up on it. I looked around. The cars on the other end of the bridge started their engines. They knew what was going on, and so did I, even though I didn't want to believe it. I climbed up next to Dora. I took her small hand in my own and looked her in her eyes. And then, we jumped. We resurfaced inside of a warm underground pool. I climbed out of the water and helped Dura, who couldn't swim with all of her thick clothes on shore. She still had her rifle, but I had lost mine. A blue ultraviolet light shone down on us from the ceiling. I froze in my place as I looked around. The room reminiscent of a Turkish bath was filled with naked Neanderthal women. They lay spread out on carved rocks or floated around on their backs in the water, smoking long pipes. After a few seconds, I noticed that they didn't care about us. They were high out of their minds from whatever they were smoking. An opium den, I said to myself in disbelief. Dora, now limping on her left leg, began walking. One of the women grabbed her leg with a weak grip. Dora pointed her rifle at her and pulled the trigger with no hesitation, but nothing happened. The ammunition must have been ruined under the water. She turned the rifle around and hit the woman in the head with it. No one reacted. There was a set of red clothes on the wall. Dura pointed at them. I put them on and covered my face. It wouldn't fool anyone for long, but maybe it would buy me a few extra seconds. We crept up a flight of stairs and entered an empty corridor. We turned the corner just to find another empty corridor, and then we walked up another set of stairs and entered a third, equally empty corridor. It was a maze. From time to time, we passed a few civilians or workers who weren't on duty. They didn't seem to know who we were. Probably I had been kept a secret to everyone, except a selected few. We stepped into a long hallway with armed guards at the other end. Both walls had rows of hollowed-out barred alcoves filled with Denisovan prisoners, all of them yelling and wailing. From what I could tell, they had recently been captured, and their spirits weren't entirely broken yet. The guards shouted at us as soon as they saw us. One of them picked up his radio from his belt and yelled something into it. We tried going back, but stopped in our tracks as we heard more guards coming from that direction. Once again, we were trapped. The guards on the other end were joined by a group of soldiers that began walking through the hallway toward us. We didn't have anything to defend ourselves with. I was sure this was it, the end of our futile attempt at escaping. Dura, too short to reach it, pointed at what looked like a set of controls on the wall. At first I didn't react, not because it was difficult to understand, but because I was too stressed to think. Dora shouted at me. I snapped out of my paralysis and grabbed the biggest lever on the panel. But Dora kept trying to tell me something. I was doing it wrong somehow. I had to stop, look at the panel, and think. An almost impossible task. Next to the lever, there were sets of metal switches. Without thinking about what they could be, I began flipping all of them in a frantic motion. Dura leaned her head against the wall and closed her eyes. It was time to pull the lever. Although all of this happened in less than a minute, it felt like an eternity. I thought the lever was stuck at first, but it was just that I was weaker than I had ever been before. The soldiers had started running toward us now and even fired at me. They probably didn't follow their orders, given that they had avoided firing at me before, but rather acted out of fear of what I was doing. The bullets bounced off the walls next to my head. I screamed, grabbed the lever with my other hand as well, and used my body weight to pull it down. It worked. I had no idea what would happen, but I did not have to wait long to find out. The cells, represented by the switches, opened up, 
and the prisoners leached out and turned on their tormentors. In the chaos that followed, Dora took me by my hand and slinked past everything. In the middle of the hallway, close to the floor, there was a ventilation shaft. Dora grabbed a rifle from a soldier being attacked by a Denisovan and kicked open the shaft. We crawled inside. The echo from the screams faded away as we went forward. The air flowing through it was ice cold. After some time, we passed above a room where two researchers examined something on a large round table. I stopped and looked down the air vent. Alex! The researchers looked up at me. Their mouths were covered with surgical masks. My heart dropped to my feet. Alex's naked body was strapped to the table, like a macabre version of the Vitruvian Man. His head was missing. Dura, who crawled in front of me, gestured to me to continue. I had no choice but to comply. My god, he's dead, he's dead, he's dead, I whispered, trying to hold my tears back. Maybe he had died by mistake. Or maybe they had chosen to examine his body while they focused on my mind. A numbness came over me. It suppressed my panic. My best friend was dead. I heard his words like an echo inside my head as I kept going. There's a certain balance here, you know? We crawled, climbed, and jumped down to different floors. My hands turned freezing cold from the metallic surface, then red, then numb, hard, and pale. If I didn't get out of here soon, I would get frostbite. When we finally did get out, we found ourselves inside of the mine. The slaves didn't do anything to stop us. In fact, they acted as if they were afraid of us. I felt for them while we ran past them, trying to find our way up to the surface. Their misery knew no limits. Their only crime was belonging to the wrong species, which apparently lay outside of the Neanderthal's circle of empathy. I wondered what life was like in the heart of the Denisovan civilization. The Neanderthal slave drivers, snapping with their long black whips, luckily didn't seem to have been informed about us. We walked on a narrow path. On our right, the miners were hacking away at the bedrock with their heavy pickaxes, and on our left, a deep cliff revealed a dark canyon that must have been carved out by miners for over a century or more. Slowly, our skin got covered in black grime. One breath felt like smoking an entire pack of cigarettes. On the other end of the chasm, armed soldiers, talking into their radios, shone light from flashlights in the face of everyone to see if it was us. Dura kept going without any sign of giving up, but I couldn't tell if she knew where she was going. All I could tell was that we kept walking upward. After some time of this constant walking, she stopped. A deep rumbling noise followed, seemingly coming from the surface, and one second later a few stalactites fell into the abyss from above. It was a rocket launch, I figured, meaning we were finally close to the surface now. Dura remained still for a moment as if she were contemplating in what direction to go next, and then she said something to me and went on. We came to a couple of circular stairs. They were cramped and dark, but extending far up from the bottom. Slowly, while I kind of hunched behind her, Dura ascended the stairs. Somewhere in the middle, we heard some radio chatter a few meters further up. It felt like my heart stopped. I held my breath. Dura sat down and checked if her rifle was loaded. Then she pointed it in front of her. The soldier above us must have heard us as well because he expected us when he came down. He pressed himself against the wall like a shadow. He shot first, but only by a fraction of a second. The sound of the guns was amplified in the staircase. I felt a sting of pain in my shoulder. I was hit. The soldier, with his large hand on his chest, fell down. I touched my shoulder. The bullet had gone right through it, piercing me. Strangely, the pain didn't bother me that much, but that was probably just due to the cold in my shock. For the second time since I arrived here, 
My eyes had to get used to daylight after being exposed to nothing more than dim lights for a long, long time. It looked like we had exited through an emergency exit that wasn't in much use. The tower lay maybe a mile away. This was closer to the launching pad. That was lucky. The area had been evacuated right before the latest launch. Loud sirens, blasting a deep and eerie sound, could be heard from the tower. They were in a state of red alert, all because of our escape. Two airships hung in the air, with a thin layer of snow on top of them. I looked around. It wasn't summer anymore. A few meters away, there was a parking lot. It was empty except for a truck. The guard in the staircase must have arrived in it. It was of the same type as the ones the hunters had used. Dura climbed inside. It made sense. We wouldn't have gotten far by foot. However, the road led right through the site. She started the engine, just barely reaching down to the pedals. She gave me the rifle. This was it. The only way out. Soldiers were already approaching. They fired at us. But as soon as we reached full speed, there wasn't that much they could do but watch us race past them. The large truck almost fell over, balancing on the left side, as Dura took a sharp curve next to the tower. I pointed the rifle out of the window to my right, and fired at a couple of soldiers entering three cars that resembled black Ferraris from the 80s. But I didn't hit any of them. I mean, no we smashed right through the gates that led out of the site while the guards jumped away from it. Thankfully, no one seemed too eager to shoot to kill, which made our escape a lot easier than it otherwise would have been. The three cars followed us, silently. This was the same road the hunters had taken us to after they had captured Alex and I. I kept my eyes open for the hill we had climbed. Would I be able to get back? I had lost a lot of weight since I got here, and would probably fit inside the opening by now, and Dora was definitely small enough. I wasn't about to leave her in this hostile place, not after she helped me escape. A woolly rhino, amazing to see even in my present condition, stood on the road in front of us. Dura ignored it and kept driving right at it at full speed. She looked at it with determination in her eyes. I was getting nervous. What are you doing? I said. Turn left. I began to point with my hand to try and make her understand. She didn't listen. I even tried to turn the steering wheel, but she pushed me away with a forceful growl. And then, only a second or less away from hitting the rhino, she sharply steered to the left. I fell to the side. Dora had known exactly what she was doing. Behind us, there was a loud crash. I peeked out the window. Our pursuers hadn't seen the rhino and smashed right into it. A fatal frontal collision. The leading car was flying in the air, landing on its roof, and the others rolled over. Dura's decision to sacrifice the rhino, now lying dead on the road, had hopefully bought us the time we needed. Holy shit, I said, and relaxed a little for the first time since we escaped. I put my hand on my shoulder. It had begun to hurt, much more now. Dora took her eyes off the road for a second. When she saw the pain in my face, she looked genuinely concerned. There was a stillness on the road. The moon, a moon with no footsteps on its surface, could faintly be seen against the blue sky and the sun was soon about to set. It was dusk when I saw the hill. Stop! I yelled and pointed at it. I tried to say a few words in her language to make her understand. She seemed confused, but eventually stopped the truck. There was no time to lose. I pointed at myself and then toward the hill. Then I grabbed her arm and made her follow me into the deep forest. We plodded through the snow, almost drowning in it. It would be easy for the soldiers to follow our tracks. I looked back at the road. Two black spots could be seen in the sky, slowly growing larger. The airships. They were coming for us. I had to find the cave fast. But after all this time, it was difficult to remember exactly where it was. Soon, it would be completely dark. We climbed the hill 
and went down to the other side. This was close. Fifteen minutes later, I found it. There was no snow near it, as if it had been melted away due to the hotter air coming out of it. Dura, understandably confused, looked at the small entrance. My arm ached, and my entire body was shivering. If I didn't get back to my world soon, I would die of hypothermia. To fit in the opening, and especially the second opening inside, we had to take off as much of our clothes as possible. I tried to communicate this to Dora, but I'm not sure how successful I was. I began taking off her heavy cloaks and capes that she had used to blend in with the guards while I pointed at the entrance. She just stood there, looking at me with the saddest expression I've ever seen. Her cheeks were red from the cold, and her large nose runny. Her clouded breath was rapid, revealing her fear. When one of the last garments fell off her body, her eyes fell on her belly, and as I looked down at it, I saw why. She was heavily pregnant, carrying our child. There was no way for her to enter the second entrance in that condition. No, 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 I whispered as I began to cry. A million thoughts went through my head. I knew the airships were getting closer with every second. They hadn't seen us yet. It was imperative that they didn't find, or at least took special notice, of the cave. I put Dora's clothes back on her. There was no escape for her. She was going to get caught, and I… I was too scared, too weak. This moment is the one I'm the most ashamed of. She had gone through all of this, trying to save the father of her child and herself, even though and maybe because she was pregnant, and I didn't have the guts to stay at her side in this defining moment. I pointed to the right, tears running down my cheeks, and told her to go in that direction, and then I pointed at myself and the cave. After that, I tried to make her understand that she couldn't tell the soldiers about it. I did this by using a few words in her language that I had learned, and by pointing at the cave and then making the hush sign with my finger. There was no way for me to know if the understood what I meant. I could only hope. Perhaps she thought she would meet up with me on the other side of the cliff. I don't know, but after I yelled at her, she did as I said and walked away. Luckily, the lack of snow outside the cave meant we didn't leave any prints for the soldiers to discover. The only thing I heard as I crawled through the small passage was the echoes of my weeping. I've returned to the cave once a month, and there haven't been any signs of anyone coming out of it. I've put a large boulder in front of the entrance that can't easily be moved from the inside, and I've leaned some heavy sticks against it to see if someone moves it. So far, it seems like Dora kept the cave a secret. Dora. By now, if she survived, my child is one year old. Not a day has gone by without me thinking about them. I regret my decision to return to my world without her. But during this year, I've been keeping myself busy. On the table behind me right now, there are a few things that were very difficult to get a hold of. A bunch of automatic rifles and semi-automatic pistols. Tons of ammo for them. Grenades, a rocket launcher and a lot more. I'm going back. This time, I'll be ready. I'm going to show them the true nature of Homo sapiens. They won't know what hit them. I'll give them hell. <laughs>